Hello and thanks for joining us for today's video. But before we start, we're excited to bring you a word from our sponsor, The Ridge. The Ridge is the maker of the best wallets in the world. They're slim, durable, RFID blocking, and practical. They hold up to 12 cards plus your cash. I've been using Ridge products for years now and I love them. So I was super excited when they sent me some new items. The first item is really cool. It's a key case that holds two to six keys. I love it because it easily fits in any of my pockets and I don't get jabbed with keys anymore. They also sent me two awesome wallets to add to my collection. I also got a coin tray that holds things like coins and keys and it fits into their wallets. Then there's the AirTag money clip which is useful for someone who is as absent minded as me. And finally, I thought this was really cool. It's a watch. Like I already said, The Ridge makes the best wallets and I'm not the only one who thinks so. They have over 50,000 5 star reviews. Plus, as you can see, they have many other great products. You should check them out by going to ridge.com slash listed or click on the link below. Then use the coupon code listed to get 10% off. So please check out the Ridge today because you'll find something great and useful and you'll be supporting Criminally Listed. Number 3. Nicole Cable Nicole Cable was born in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin on August 12, 1997. At some point, she and her family moved to Gladburn, Maine. Nicole was a typical teenager who spent her time texting friends and enjoyed spending time with her mother and stepfather, Christine and Jason Wiley, and her siblings. As a sophomore at Old Town High School, Nicole was a cheerleader. Life was great for the teen, but unfortunately, all that would change with a Facebook friend. One day, a person who identified themselves as Brian Butterfield friend and Nicole on the popular social media site. The two spoke often. He continued to make online advances of the teen wanting to sleep with her. Nicole rejected the request multiple times. Eventually, Nicole agreed to meet with Butterfield if he brought her some marijuana. On the night of May 12, 2013, 15-year-old Nicole told her mother, Christine, that she was going to meet a friend at the end of the driveway. Then, she vanished. Christine reported Nicole missing the following day. Dozens of law enforcement officers with aircrafts, dogs, and volunteers helped search for Nicole, but they couldn't find any trace of her. Eight days after she went missing, on May 20th, a person found Nicole's body in the woods near Old Town, Maine. The autopsy revealed she had died of asphyxiation based on the compressions around her neck. At the time of her funeral, there were over 300 people in attendance. Investigators searched Nicole's phone and computer. They found she had interacted with Brian Butterfield frequently with as many requests for them to meet. The police tracked down Brian Butterfield. They quickly learned he had not been the one talking to Nicole. It turned out that someone living in the same area had created a Facebook account and used his name and pictures. Butterfield suspected it was 20-year-old Kyle Doobie. His ex-girlfriend was dating Kyle and Butterfield said that he and Kyle didn't like each other. Facebook provided records to identify the person behind the fake Brian Butterfield account. The police traced the records to Kyle Doobie who lived with his parents in Rono, Maine. Kyle was arrested on May 21, 2013. Kyle's brother, Dustin Doobie, was questioned by the police and he had a bizarre story. He said that Kyle told him he had only intended to kidnap Nicole while wearing ski goggles to shield his identity. Then he was going to pretend to save her and then he'd be her hero. But the plan went horribly wrong. He bound her with duct tape, including wrapping it around her head. He then placed her in the trunk of his father's vehicle. However, the duct tape went over her airways and she suffocated. When he discovered she was dead, he dumped the body. Kyle Doobie went to trial for Nicole Cable's murder on February 23, 2015. He pleaded not guilty. Several witnesses took the stand at the trial, including fellow inmates, his girlfriend at the time of the murder, Sarah Mensinger, and Detective Kyle Willett, who specialized in analyzing calls and texts. The fellow inmate testified that Kyle admitted to killing Nicole. Sarah Mensinger said that Kyle spoke to her on the phone after the murder and told her where he left the body. 
At one point in the trial, Kyle attempted to blame Sarah for the murder, saying she was jealous. He claimed that she created the fake Facebook account and wanted to hurt Nicole. Sarah denied the allegations. Detective Willett's testimony shined a light on Nicole's final moments and where Kyle's location was in relation to her being kidnapped and then murdered. He analyzed Nicole's calls and texts with Kyle. She had texted Kyle's phone and Facebook Messenger app hours before she was killed. Detective Willett confirmed the cell towers that picked up Kyle's phone signal as he texted both Nicole and Sarah. One of the towers was near Kyle's workplace in Bangor, Maine. Another tower was close to where the body was found. Evidence provided to the jury included the final messages between Nicole and Kyle. Nicole asked Kyle if it was weird to be a little scared. Kyle wrote, no, I wouldn't be. Other evidence presented included DNA samples from Nicole's hat, which matched DNA found on one of Kyle's socks. Kyle's defense lawyer argued that anyone could have accessed Kyle's computer and phone. The trial concluded 10 days later and the jury deliberated for an hour. They found Kyle Duby guilty. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison, 30 years for the kidnapping and 30 years for the murder. By the time of this video, 30-year-old Kyle Duby is incarcerated at the Maine State Prison in Warren, Maine. His earliest possible release date is July 2065 when he will be 72 years old. Number 2. Justin Bloxham Justin Bloxham was born in Shreveport, Louisiana on May 29, 1997. He had three brothers and loved to skateboard and play football. In the spring of 2010, Justin was 12 years old. Like many people his age, Justin loved to text with his friends, family, and strangers that he connected with on MySpace. On his MySpace account, his tagline said he was the friendly neighborhood pimp. It caught the attention of someone using an account claiming to be a 15-year-old girl. In late March 2010, kids in Shreveport were on spring break. On March 30th, 2010, Justin went to a sleepover at his best friend Dustin's house. While there, he had been texting back and forth with a 15-year-old girl. She was trying to get Justin to meet up with her to have sex. Justin finally agreed to meet her. The girl told him she would send a cab to pick him up. Around 3 a.m., a green cab appeared on Dustin's street and Justin got into the cab, vanishing into the night. Dustin woke up the following day on March 31st to find his friend was gone. He went to Justin's house and his parents became worried when he was not there. Justin's parents filed a missing persons report around 10 a.m. that morning and the search began. Meanwhile, a police officer noticed a green cab parked on Highway 171 around 6.30 a.m. The registered driver, 34-year-old Brian Horn, told the officer he had lost his keys and he was waiting for help from the cab company. He was later identified as the suspect because the same green cab was seen in Dustin's neighborhood. Officers returned to the area of the highway where the cab was seen. The police found some boot prints and they followed them. It led them to the body of 12-year-old Justin Bloxham. Justin had been strangled to death. The police searched Horn's house and they found muddy boots. The treads on the boots were matched to the boot prints in the mud. Horn was arrested for Justin's murder. Horn had a criminal record. He was a two-time sex offender who had previously served time in a Missouri prison for a felony sexual assault. Despite his previous charges, he managed to get a job as a taxi driver. He enjoyed various sex activities, which include swinging and watching his wife have sex with teenagers. He felt he was doing a good deed for virgins. The trial for Justin's murder began in early 2014. Horn's lawyer told the jury that while his client was a sex offender, he said that Horn didn't rape boys. He said that Horn's previous sex crimes had only involved females. His lawyer also said that since Horn enjoyed watching his wife have sex with other people, the text messages between Justin and Horn were to have another virgin have sex with his wife. 
The lawyer then suggested the teens want to have sex with adults. He said that Horn probably felt justified and thought it would be fun for both of them. There was no intention to kill Justin. The lawyer also pointed out that there was no DNA evidence that suggested that Horn touched Justin. The semen found in Justin's boxers belonged to him, though it's unclear why it was there. The prosecutor detailed how Horn lured Justin, who at first resisted. On April 2, 2014, closing statements were presented. One of the prosecutors told the jury to think about the last text message Justin sent to Horn after Horn had sent him explicit photos posing as the young girl. Justin wrote to him, You gotta remember, I'm only 12. The text message was important because it showed that Justin reminded Horn of his age. The jury took less than an hour to deliberate and they found Horn guilty. He was sentenced to death. However, his sentence was overturned in 2018 by the Louisiana Supreme Court due to another precedent set by another case. The case involved Robert McCoy, who was also on death row. McCoy rejected his lawyer's decision to concede that he was responsible for murdering two people in 2008. Horne also claimed that his lawyer conceded his guilt without his consent. Horne went to trial again in late June 2023. The trial lasted five days and then the jury deliberated for less than 20 minutes. Once again, Brian Horn was found guilty of killing 12-year-old Justin Bloxham. He was sentenced to death. Number 1. Carly Ryan Carly Ryan was born in Adelaide, Australia on January 31, 1992. Her mother Sonia was 20 years old at the time. As a result, the mother and daughter duo had a close relationship. Carly was described as an emo teen. She would mostly wear black clothes and wear heavy eyeshadow paired with bright lipstick. She joined a goth website called VampireFreaks.com and it was on there in 2006 that she connected with who she thought was an 18 year old boy named Brandon Kane who lived in Melbourne, Australia. Brandon supposedly lived with his stepfather, Shane. During their various chats, Brandon told her he was Texas born. He said he liked emo music and that he was an aspiring musician. Carly was infatuated with her new love and told her mother about him. At times, Sonia would see the two chatting online, thinking nothing of it. On January 26, 2007, Brandon's stepfather, Shane, arrived in Adelaide for Carly's 15th birthday. He said he was dropping off gifts on behalf of Brandon. The gifts were some lingerie and a nurse's outfit. Shane told Carly that he loved her and he would not let anything happen to her. He said she was beautiful and then sexually touched her. Carly was put off by Shane's sexual advances and told him he was old, fat, and gross. This did not sit well with Shane. Carly confided in Sonia after the party about what had happened. Sonia tracked down an email linked to Shane and told him to stay away from her daughter. She received a scathing reply. It reads, Bitch please. That email was so full of lies and hearsay and I am disgusted that someone of a reasonable intelligence could believe such crap to be true. Following the incident, Sonia took away Carly's access to the internet and confiscated her phone. However, that did not stop her from talking to Brandon. A couple weeks after the incident with Shane, on February 19th, 2007, Carly told Sonia she was going to meet with a couple of friends for a sleepover. Sonia remembered her daughter having a funny look in her eye. Carly hugged her mom four times before saying, see you later. It was the last time Sonia would see Carly alive. Carly went to meet up with Brandon near an isolated beach near Port Elliot in South Australia, a little more than 80 kilometers from her home. When she got there, there was two men, a young man, and the man who claimed to be Brandon's stepfather, Shane. Shane beat Carly, attempted to suffocate her in the sand, and then eventually threw her body in the shallow water for her to drown in. When she was thrown into the water, she was likely unconscious. The body of 15-year-old Carly Ryan was found floating in the water the next day. The autopsy revealed she had suffered 19 separate injuries. 
At least 68 of the injuries were blows to her head. The medical examiner determined Carly's death was from drowning. The police reviewed security footage near Port Elliot and saw Carly with two men. The suspects were seen in a pale blue car. Eleven days later, the police finally found their suspects, 50-year-old Gary Francis Newman and his 18-year-old son, who was not publicly identified. When they arrived, Newman was logged into a chat site and posing as Brandon Kane. He was speaking with another 14-year-old girl from Perth, Australia. It turned out that Newman had over 200 fake online personas. The police found notebooks filled with pages of fake names, ages, and passwords. Newman had a dark history leading up to Carly's murder. He was once married to a woman named Christine. Christine struggled to survive her marriage because Newman was abusive. The slice misstep led to Christine being beaten up by Newman. Newman was obsessed with extreme porn, mainly in which women dressed as schoolgirls. At one point, Newman had attempted to rape his then 13-year-old daughter after getting her drunk. Eventually, Christine left Newman and they got divorced. Newman attempted to blame his son for Carly's murder, but it was determined he was there when Carly arrived, but he did not participate in the murder. Gary Newman went to trial in December 2009 and it lasted three months. Newman denied murdering Carly, but the judge ultimately found him guilty. The judge said that Newman was sexually obsessed with Carly, noting that the crime was terribly cruel. Newman was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 29 years on March 31, 2010. Carly's murder was the first catfishing murder in Australia. Today, Sonia fights to ensure that no other predators can catfish minors and predators are brought to justice. A new law called Carly's Law was passed on June 15, 2017, 10 years after Carly's murder. The law allows law enforcement to take action against predators before they act on their intentions. It was used for the first time two months after its creation in August 2017. A 35-year-old sex offender who was posing as a young woman to groom children was arrested. He received 14 charges, including grooming children online and sharing child pornography. Though it won't bring Carly back, Sonia won't ensure that her daughter's legacy lives on. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.